All right, our keynote speaker today is someone who is no stranger to the local government and our issues and challenges. He is Dean of the College of Environmental Design at Cal Poly Pomona, that's not SLO, I might add. The only university in California which combines the environmental design features in fields of architecture, landscape architecture, and urban and regional planning with an art department and a teaching and research laboratory on sustainable development. He was the first trained urban planner and the first Asian American elected to the Los Angeles City Council, where he served eight years as the representative of Hollywood and surrounding neighborhoods. He spearheaded the Hollywood Redevelopment Plan, which land policy and financial framework for Hollywood's current revitalization played a key role in choosing the route and station locations of the Metro Red Subway. And I might add, just as a quick personal anecdote, I was in uh, Hollywood last fall and saw some of the fine work that I think that he was involved in, uh, some of the restaurants, some, went on some of the subways, hotels down there. It's, it's, it's a great area right now in uh, Hollywood. And for those of you who haven't had a chance to get down to watch any Dodger games or Laker games, uh, I would suggest doing that and staying in Hollywood while you're down there. He gave up his council seat to enter the race for mayor for Los Angeles in 1993, eventually reaching second place among a field of 24 candidates. So Mayor Dellums, when they talk about Oakland having 10 candidates, it could be a lot worse. You could have 24 like in Los Angeles, and winning 46% of the citywide vote. For the past five years, he's been a mayoral appointee to the Los Angeles City Planning Commission. In his spare time, he chairs the National Board of Directors of Smart Growth America, the National Coalition Advocating Compact Development and Transit, Bicycle and Pedestrian Programs about three years ago became actively interested in the relationship between land use, transportation, and climate change. He worked as the main Southern California consultant to Climate Plan, a statewide coalition promoting better coordination of land use and transportation plans to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The Air Resources Board appointed him as one of the 21 members of the Regional Targets Advisory Committee to suggest procedures for setting regional targets for reducing automobile-related greenhouse gas emissions. A native of Los Angeles, let that just sink in for a minute. A native of Los Angeles, and a Dodgers fan, and a Lakers fan. He will be continually reinvited to ABEG General Assemblies for at least the next two years. He earned his BA, though, again, showing his statewide ability here. He earned his BA in politics and urban design from UC Santa Cruz, and received his master's of city planning degree from UC Berkeley. So, Tom. Okay, there's two of us who'd be happy now about that. And there's another interesting connection to the Bay Area. He wrote his master's thesis on the evolution of Bay Area regional government institutions, including ABAG. Please join me in giving a hearty welcome for keynote speaker, Michael Wu. Michael. Thank you very much. And uh, I really appreciate the fact that you invited somebody from Southern California and even a Dodgers fan to come be the keynote speaker this morning. Uh, it is a great honor to follow Mayor Dellums. Uh, last night at dinner, Henry Gardner and Steve Hevinger were intimidating me by telling me that Mayor Dellums has a unique ability to speak extemporaneously without notes for 45 minutes at a time and hold the audience in the palm of his hand. So that, uh, Henry and Steve, that really intimidated me in terms of getting ready this morning. Uh, I have notes. Uh, and, uh, and to Mayor Green, thank you so much for the kind words of introduction. Uh, I know you made references to professional sports, but I took particular interest in your comments about Fenton's ice cream. Uh, uh, Mayor Green, if you ever come down to Southern California, I need to challenge you by bringing you to a very special place called uh, Fossilman's Ice Cream in Alhambra, California, where in addition to the usual flavors, uh, we have uh, uh, lychee ice cream, we have some other unusual, so, so I'll challenge you to come down, be my guest, and we'll see whether, whether uh, Fenton's can stand up to a challenge from Fossilman's. Uh, and uh, and to, uh, to the local government officials in the audience, I really appreciate having the opportunity to uh, speak to you this morning. Uh, uh, and I, I hope that you won't hold the fact that I'm a native of Los Angeles against me. Uh, some of you might be thinking that this is something like inviting a Dodger fan to come throw the first pitch at opening day of a, of a Giants game. 
it's not quite that simple. There's, there's more to the story. Uh, although I was born in Los Angeles, uh, the facts of my birth uh, don't necessarily preclude my ability to appreciate other cities and other regions. Back in the 1970s, when I came to the Bay Area to start graduate school, uh, I frequently wondered what is the basis of the difference between the San Francisco Bay Region and Southern California? Uh, I think that it's more than geography, it's more than topography. Uh, what I gradually came to appreciate is, number one, there is a sense of regional consciousness here in the San Francisco Bay Area that does not exist in the same way in Southern California. And that consciousness, whether it's based on the ability to see a large body of water or to see hills in the background and to have a sense of connection with people who may live or work many miles away, is something that is a, a clear difference between the North and the South. But I think it also creates opportunities to do things in the Bay Area that may be more difficult in other parts of the state. So number one is the sense of regional consciousness here. Another is uh, the political will. That is, unlike other parts of the state, here in your region, there are signs of a greater political will to tackle some of the tough challenges which in other parts of the state may elude an easier solution. Uh, uh, the fact that local government officials from different parts of the region are willing not just to travel to Oakland, but are willing to work together, sometimes compromise in, in pursuit of a common good, is something which doesn't happen often enough in our political process. And certainly, SB 375 will provide a real challenge, a real test of that uh, continuing ability to demonstrate political will. Third is an openness to innovation an openness to experimentation, not only in terms of what the private sector does, but also in terms of government and the way in which we, we define the term public service. So I think that the, the re regional consciousness, the presence of political will, and the openness to experimentation puts the San Francisco Bay Area into a unique position within California in terms of demonstrating what can be done with SB 375. Now, when I first came to the Bay Area in the 1970s, I had the good luck of not only studying uh, city and regional planning here, but also uh, I was able to work with and fall under the spell of a very special professor at Berkeley, Professor T.J. Kent, Jr. For the urban planners in the room, you may recall the name. He was the author of this book, uh, The Urban General Plan, but also he used to be a San Francisco planning director. He used to be uh, a, a city councilman in Berkeley. And very significantly, he was the co-founder of People for Open Space, which later became known as the Greenbelt Alliance. And in working with Professor Kent, I learned a lot of different things. One was that you can't necessarily keep city planning separate from politics or politics separate from city planning. I also learned that while someone can have very deep roots at the most local level, the neighborhood level, the city level, that it is hard to avoid regional implications. That is, you have to be able to see beyond your immediate neighborhood, even beyond your city, in terms of understanding how things fit together on a regional basis. And it was Professor Kemp who uh, suggested to me that I should write a master's thesis back in the 70s about the evolution of, San of regional institutions here in the San Francisco Bay Area. It was here that I learned about the story of BCDC and the battle at the local level to fight the temptation to fill in San Francisco Bay with land in order to, pr to provide more development potential at the local level. It was there that I learned about the gradual evolution of agencies like ABAG MTC, uh, and what became a historic but ultimately unsuccessful effort uh, at the state level to create a multi-purpose regional agency uh, serving the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, I don't know how many people in the room know about some of the dramatic stories. For example, uh, back around 1970 or 71, there was a serious bill to create a uh, multi-purpose regional agency in the San Francisco Bay Area, spearheaded by the then state senator from San Francisco, Eugene McAteer, 
who, in addition to being a state senator and the author of this bill, was considered the front-running candidate to be, become mayor of San Francisco, mayor of the leading, uh, the then, I guess even then not the largest city in the region, but certainly one of the leading cities in the region. Uh, and then suddenly, while playing handball, he dropped dead of a heart attack. And uh, it was an illustration of uh, the importance of having the right person at the right place at the right time. With Senator McAteer's passing, the momentum to pushing in the direction of multi-purpose, uh, a multi-purpose regional ag agency fell down and uh, that bill never became law and subsequ subsequent efforts to resuscitate it did not succeed. Nevertheless, Bay Area regionalism is alive and well as demonstrated by all the things that have happened in the last few decades and the momentum that you are now developing with the beginning of a sustainable community strategies process. Um, before I go on, let me first say a few words in praise of local government. Uh, after I, I got my degree here at Berkeley, I got a job working in state government. I, I was an assistant to then the then uh, Senate Majority Leader, and so I had a chance for four years to learn how laws are made. As Steve Hevinger learned working for Senator Kopp many years ago, uh, I, I had my apprenticeship working in the state legislature, and it was after four years of working in the legislature I started to realize that, you know, being a state legislator isn't necessarily that special. Uh, in other words, uh, from watching legislators do their work, passing laws, making state government work, I started to come to the conclusion that uh, not only state legislators, but people who run for office are not really that special. Uh, they're actually, most of them, quite normal. But what you see in the legislative process and in the workings of government is what happens when you take people who are mostly normal and put them into very unusual or extra normal circumstances. Uh, I think for the general public, for the voters, it's sometimes hard to understand that. And sometimes, as you, as members of the audience may realize, there may be a tendency sometimes to impute to elected officials certain superhuman qualities uh, and a feeling that you have to be superhuman to be a local elected official. So I don't know if you all in the audience would agree. I really don't think it takes superhuman qualities to be an elected official, either at the state level or the local level. But it does take stamina. It does take uh, the, abil the ability to have a thick skin. Uh, I do remember, uh, even though I, I have many positive associations with being a member of a city council, frankly, I don't miss having cons constituents come up to me when I'm shopping for zucchini, complaining about why their garbage wasn't picked up. Uh, I don't miss getting phone calls in the middle of the night from a constituent who wants to know what I can do to get that car that's blocking their driveway taken away. Uh, I don't miss some of those things. However, uh, sometimes I do miss having the ability to pick up a telephone and, and call somebody and make something happen. Uh, I do sometimes miss uh, the sense that I used to occasionally have as a member of a city council, having the satisfaction of feeling I can actually get something done. Whether it's filling a pothole or getting that truck or car moved from somebody that's blocking somebody's driveway, I used to at least occasionally get the feeling that what I was doing was making a difference. And so I think that uh, even with all the challenges of being a, a local elected official today, there are still a lot of positive things to be said in praise of local government, that level of the government, which, for better or for worse, is closer to the people. Um, now, however, uh, as, as we look at the, the beginning of the implementation of SB 375, uh, there are a, a number of challenges being raised uh, not only in the San Francisco Bay Area, but also in other parts of the state, about what does this mean in terms of uh, uh, evolving the role of local government, addressing some of the, key, the very keen challenges which we are facing. Uh, California has a history of leading the way in the United States on some very important laws relating to the environment and planning. Of course, the California Environmental Quality Act, the, uh, uh, when, when, when the BCDC Act was adopted, actually, that was really path-breaking. And then after that, the California Coastal Act. Uh, 
so on some planning laws and some environmental areas, California has led the way. When we talk about sustainable development or smart growth, uh, it was curious to me, as someone who was an urban planner and somebody interested in smart growth, that California did not seem to lead the way. And instead, more typically, other states, such as Maryland or Vermont or some other states, many times smaller states where the distance from local communities to the state capital was not as far, it seemed as if certain other states were more taking the lead relating to smart growth. But what's changed this, uh, uh, I believe, is the rise of the awareness of climate change. Uh, I remember a few years ago in Los Angeles when I, I was teaching urban planning at USC, and like many other members of the general public, I was starting to notice that there's something going on relating to this issue relating to greenhouse gas emissions. I don't know how many of you, like me, stay up late at night watching cable television and occasionally seeing these uh, public service announcements from the World Wildlife Fund, which usually feature a, a, uh, a sad photograph of a polar bear uh, uh, standing on a shrinking uh, ice mass. Uh, uh, gradually over time, I was starting to think, there's something happening out there, and I needed to figure out what could be done about it. For me, this was the introduction to uh, what has become an increasingly important obsession over the last few years, which is the connection between land use and transportation and that polar bear on a shrinking glacier. Uh, if I were giving a PowerPoint presentation, this is the moment at which I'd be showing a slide that would show the polar bear on the left and a uh, typical urban sprawl development on the right. The question being, is there a connection between the plight of that polar bear and the decisions that we make relating to land use and transportation, the decisions we make at the local level about where housing is going to be located and what kind of transportation we're going to use for people to travel between their homes and their jobs. Uh, Gradually, I think that more and more people are starting to realize there is indeed a connection between that sad polar bear and the decisions that we make thousands of miles away about where people live and the transportation and the energy that we use, the uh, carbon that we burn in order to make it possible to live the way that we have chosen to live. And so I believe that coming out of that growing awareness the momentum that developed as people started to realize that connection between land use and transportation and energy and climate change, out of that came first AB 32, the uh, a groundbreaking law uh, author, well, proposed initially by then Assemblywoman, now uh, Senator Fran Pavley, uh, which committed California to uh, uh, the goal of rolling back greenhouse gas emissions by the year 2020 back to 1990 levels. Then, many people were surprised a couple years after that when Senator Steinberg uh, succeeded in getting Senate Bill 375 passed. Uh, and while it's true that the final version of SB 375 uh, did, was not quite as, as strong or as comprehensive as the original version, it's still quite an accomplishment that that bill got through the legislature and eventually got signed by the governor. So that then brings us to where we are today and, and the special role which I believe is ahead of the uh, San Francisco Bay region. Uh, in my opinion, the San Francisco Bay region has a special mission, which is different, perhaps, at least in degree, than the mission of other regions within the state. Here in the San Francisco Bay Area, as in some other parts of the state, real estate trends already are, to some extent, pointing in the direction of more sustainable development. There is a rising level of interest and experience among real estate developers in doing infill development in figuring out how to make money by developing transit-oriented development and moving further in the direction of uh, land use and transportation patterns which don't use as much uh, uh, greenhouse, which don't generate as many greenhouse gas emissions. And the experience which ABAG has had 
uh, first with the earlier blueprint process and now with the current focus initiative, I think puts the uh, San Francisco Bay region far out ahead of many of the other regions of the state. I've heard about some of the lessons that have been learned from the earlier blueprint process, uh, which now have been applied to the current focus initiative. Certainly, uh, uh, there's a lot that all of us could learn all over California about the best way to involve local elected officials and the best way to generate local stakeholder interest, including neighborhood associations, environmental groups, and others. But I think that that learning process, which ABAG and the other regional agencies have gone through uh, have been very useful and constructive in terms of showing you what you need to do to be able to get local government officials to support a process. The idea of creating um, priority development areas and priority conservation areas based on proposals coming from the local officials themselves, I think makes a lot of sense. And it's a good process for giving local government officials a sense that the, the process is not being imposed from a higher level, but instead is coming from the bottom up. So next comes the sustainable community strategy. Um, and, and here's where I believe the San Francisco Bay Area has a real opportunity to set a model for the rest of the state. Now, there are a number of issues that have to be dealt with. Uh, I understand that even in the San Francisco Bay Area, there is some sense that SB 375 and the SCS process is an external process, an outside process being imposed by the state that does not serve local priorities. Uh, there is some concern from some who say that uh, it's a good idea, but this is the wrong time to be doing it, especially when uh, the economy is in the state that it's in. Uh, there are others who tell me that uh, it's a good idea, but we just don't have the resources, either money or skills, at the local level to play a constructive role in the SCS process. Let me try to take these one by one and, and talk about what, what can be done about it. First of all, in terms of local governments who are afraid that there isn't money to do it, uh, uh, I would point out that uh, while the state is not doing as much as some of us at the local level would want to support the SCS process, there are some resources out there that local governments can go after. You may be aware that the Strategic Growth Council has approved the first $20 million in Proposition 84 funds, which will be used to uh, enable local governments to work with regional agencies uh, to support an SCS process. Furthermore, at the federal level, a partnership of uh, uh, EPA, uh, the Department of Transportation, and HUD are making $100 million available at the national level to promote sustainable development and the kinds of efforts that, that the SCS process proposes. So while the state is not doing as much as we would like, there are starting to be some funds being made available from both the state and from Washington, D.C. to uh, support what will be needed. Uh, and so I encourage you to look at those sources. Let me say a word about the economy. Concern about the state of the economy is perhaps the point of the spear which is, trying, which is being used right now to try to puncture the momentum that is being uh, uh, fomented uh, in support of SB 375 and AB 32. I'm sure that many of you in this room are aware of the efforts, uh, uh, the discussion going on at the League of California Cities uh, about the idea of either supporting an initiative to uh, limit the applicability of AB 32 and SB 375, or proposals to slow down the SCS process. In Southern California, I've been in a number of meetings where the state of the economy is being used as an excuse to try to persuade local governments to not participate in a regional SCS process or to do what they can. Um, I think that this is really short-sighted. It's, it's uh, an unfortunate example of some leaders who are trying to say that uh, instead of looking at SB 375 as an opportunity to move local communities in the direction that they already want to move in, uh, that instead it's a very sad effort to distract attention from the pressing need to look at land use, look at transportation, and be serious about greenhouse gas emissions. As you may know, uh, our use of cars and light trucks 
is the number one source of greenhouse gas emissions within the state. And of course, much of the use of cars and light trucks is driven by the land use decisions that we're making at the local level that may give individuals no alternative but to drive cars long distances and to burn fossil fuels in order to get between home and work. Uh, in some and that 40% figure is only an average. Uh, in other words, in certain parts of the state, for example, the city of Irvine in the Skag region uh, recently completed work or is immersed in work on its local climate action plan. They found that within their city, more like 60% of all the greenhouse gas emissions uh, generated within their city were attributable to the use of cars and light trucks. So, in other words, if we really want to do something about global warming and climate change, we can't do it without addressing the number one cause, our use of cars and light trucks. And rather than think that a time of economic downturn is the wrong time to address these issues, um, as a former local elected official who served in government at a time back in the 90s when there was a recession, I actually think that when the economy is slow, that is a good time to make changes. Uh, or at least if you're trying to make changes at a time when the economy is hotter, it, there's a lot, there's even more resistance than at a time when the economy is slow. So I actually think this is a good time. Uh, for those who think that local government officials don't have enough uh, skills to be able to do it, uh, I think that Number one, that isn't necessarily true. Number two, uh, it's an opportunity for uh, people like, for, for institutions like my school, Cal Poly Pomona, to step in. And that's part of the reason why I'm now organizing a series of ext extension courses literally aimed at the needs of local government officials, planners, elected officials uh, who want the skills learning about transportation modeling or transportation demand management or uh, sustainable land use practices to learn what they need to play an active part in that process. So uh, uh, I think this is actually a very good time to proceed for, for both the, the San Francisco Bay region and the other parts of the state. Now, uh, in closing, let me say a few words about what the San Francisco Bay region and Southern California could learn from each other. Uh, as I said in the beginning, I think that there is, a, I, I think that the Bay Area and Southern California do have different circumstances and I think they have different missions. Getting back to what I said in the very beginning, the Bay Area uh, has advantages relating to a higher level of regional consciousness, perhaps a greater, a higher level of political will uh, and, uh, and, and uh, a, a, a willingness to experiment. Uh, and I can just tell from the, the atmosphere in this room, I think the atmosphere here is quite different than the atmosphere I, I would be facing if I were giving a keynote speech at a SCAG General Assembly meeting. You can build upon that, and I, and I think that, that the Bay Area can define the edge, or in other words, can demonstrate how far a big, diverse urban region can go in terms of taking it use, making good use of the tools made available by SB 375 to move your communities in the future in the direction you want to go in. And that will help Southern California and other parts of the state. In other words, the work you do will set a high standard. I think it will demonstrate what other, other uh, regions in the state can do. Uh, uh, and, and frankly, I think Southern California and other parts of the state will need your help. Uh, if the Bay Area does a good job with an SCS and the rest of the state falls down, then SB 375 is not going to work. If, if Southern California, which, uh, inc which, which covers 48% of the state's population, cannot get its act together and, and comply with SB 375, this pioneering law will not be a success. So I hope that there are ways in which the Bay Area and Southern California can work together, uh, can learn from each other, uh, can provide each other with uh, resources to step up to this extremely important challenge. Uh, in the future, uh, if you need a Dodger fan to come up and throw the first pitch at a Giants game, I'm definitely available. Uh, but beyond that, I appreciate your willingness to invite me to come up here and talk about what we might do both with the Bay Area doing its best to define the edge 
and for Southern California to use the resources of 48% of the state to jointly demonstrate that California is able to pull itself together and to face up to the tough challenges facing us in the future. Thank you very much. The point I just wanted to, before transitioning over to our next speaker is this, is that Michael talked about Northern California setting an example that can be followed somewhere else in the state. And as for those of us who are in Alameda County or those of us who know through ABAG's Green Business Program, I just want to point out one thing that's uh, coming up there. And that is the Green Business Program that we know it as really originated in the Bay Area. And the County of Los Angeles is going to be adopting that. A program which did originate in Northern California and as I said to many people that and Mark's out there, Mark Luce is our chair of that committee, is that to me the greatest legacy of that program is going to be that, and again, that's just looking at the numbers, the, doing the math. When Los Angeles County is sitting out there with the, with the girth and the population that they have, and they're going to be doing it, it's going to supersede anything that we do in terms of green business in our own region. Not that we should not continue doing it, because we should, but again, it just shows the example when we do come up with something good in Northern California, it can be adopted, and it has been adopted in other parts of the country, and having it adopted in Los Angeles was a great testimony to that. 